section twenty five of margaret of angouleme queen of navarre by agnes mary francis robinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami chapter eighteen the end fifteen forty seven to fifteen forty nine part two it is difficult to account for these tears in margaret's nature ambition was scarcely so eminent a factor that she should break her heart over what after all was a fair match for her daughter the estates of bearn had long ago pleaded that their princess should marry no stranger but rather some great french noble who would strengthen her hands at home so that this marriage pleased the king of france the bride herself and the subjects of the bride there was nothing personally to object to in antoine de bourbon he was chivalrous and gentle though weak in disposition in fact there was no cause no reason for margaret's grief the string strained too tight had broken that was all a constitutional melancholy sharply accented by her brother's death grew stronger and stronger on her day by day blotting all the world from her in a thick haze of cloud and misery till it ended even as did the melancholy of francis in lethargy and death margaret had gone to fontainebleau but she found little comfort there in the court of diana where everything reminded her of the buried past she returned to pau for christmas with her husband and thence for her health's sake she went to mont de marsan she was getting very weak a religious misery took hold of her she did not share her husband's pleasure in wealth and good cheer she lived very quietly and simply spending much of her time in that convent of tousson where she had learned her brother's death but now in any place it was a nun's life that she led we find her expenses for the year fifteen forty eight entered into her account book exclusive of pensions loans and donations to the poor they do but reach the sum of two hundred and twenty pounds tournois four pins nine livres fifteen souls six wooden combs each three shillings sixpence four gold and silver for her needlework three marks for a gold chain to be given away one hundred and seventy five pounds for the deed of a loan to m de rohan four pounds for new year's gifts to the king of navarre thirty pounds that is the slender amount margaret had done with the world and with worldly gear she had a lodging built for her in the convent at tousson and went there in fifteen forty nine to spend her lenten retreat but the life suited her so well she stayed the summer there her leaning toward reform was no obstacle in her love for this conventual routine it was because she loved the church that she had wished to chasten it she had no desire as we have said to establish a sect outside the roman pale only to keep a spirit of national life in the church of france to keep it french while admitting the authority of rome so margaret lived in peace of conscience at tousson not alas in peace of mind her growing weakness sorely distressed her and when her physicians told her that the end was near she wept and found their saying a very bitter word her attendants reminded her of the glory of the saints in paradise the queen was not consoled all that is true she said but we stay so long a time under the earth before our coming there and then she began to weep and ask why must she die she was not yet so old but that she might well live a few years more they could not appease her horror of death her curiosity concerning the fate of the soul one of the dearest of her maids of honour falling ill and lying near to death margaret persisted in sitting by her bed knowing the disgust for mortality which she had inherited from her mother her maidens begged the queen to let them lead her away her presence could not save the poor dying girl but it was not affection that made the reluctant queen vanquish her instinctive horror that kept her sitting by the bed silent motionless looking at the face of the sufferer so fixedly so strangely that her women marvelled among themselves 
at last when all was over one ventured to ask the meaning of that look then margaret told them she had heard from learned doctors how at the actual moment of dissolution the spirit leaves the body and she had looked for the soul and listened to catch the faintest sound or rustle and she said these learned men had told her how the swan sings itself to death for love of the soul that travelleth up its long throat toward the issue to catch this issuing soul she had narrowly watched the lips of the dying girl but she had seen nothing heard nothing felt nothing and were i not firm in my faith she said i should not know what to think of this dislodging and departing of the soul then she went back to her weeping and her praying shuddering at the mystery of death striving to see beyond the visible evident grave the distant paradise but ah we stay so long under the earth before our coming there the summer dragged away and every month left margaret weaker with the autumn she moved to odos a castle near the city of tarbes here sprang wells of mineral water said to cure diseases of the chest margaret drank them but they did not dispel her languor she grew weaker and weaker her melancholy deepened into apathy she fell into a drowsiness from which her physicians could not rouse her the heart so hungry for emotions the eager intellect the generous sympathies the poignant vitality of her nature all these slept a deep slumber now but through her stupor she dreamily wondered on the nature and fate of spirits that was her preoccupation one night she dreamed that a very beautiful woman approached her bed bearing in her hands a wreath of flowers flowers of every sort that blow and these the angel said were freshly gathered for margaret to wear in paradise the queen woke a little consoled she had always put her trust in signs and visions on the faith of a dream she could believe in paradise a few days after this a great comet was seen in the sky at night the rumour went that it appeared for the death of paul the third the pope margaret who had heard this tale stood on an open balcony looking at the blazing heaven with the wintry stars in it and the meteor flung across the blue standing there she must have remembered that other and more brilliant comet which appeared before her mother's death at gréon gatinois margaret was ever superstitious suddenly her mouth was drawn a little awry her physician seeing this persuaded her to go indoors and to bed he lost no time in treating her but the december night had chilled her through the spectacle of the comet had taken her courage away and she felt persuaded she would die the chill settled on her delicate lungs and for three days she could not speak but a few moments before the last she found her voice again she caught at a cross which lay upon her bed and crying three times jesus 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 in her stifled voice she died the story of de raymond that she died a catholic declaring that she had helped the oppressed reformers rather from compassion than conviction has been received with great distrust and anger by the lutheran historians from the earliest chroniclers to miss freer it seems to me no truer words could resume the character of margaret compassion not conviction it is at once the rarest value and the limitation of her nature hence her sweet large-hearted mercy understanding and forgiving all men hence also her weakness her lack of a firm standpoint her hesitations and indecisions hence that signal bane of her influence over francis the flux and reflux of uncertain authority as gaillard has turned the phrase margaret of angouleme died at the castle of odos december twenty first fifteen forty nine at the age of fifty-seven her reign was over she who had been for a lifetime the influence and ideal of the most civilized court in europe was no more in all but sheer existence she had died two years ago when her brother breathed his last at rambouillet a different ideal was now set up in her place a different influence swayed the heart of the king of france 
a woman two years older than herself, whom some magic, as it seemed, preserved from age. The orb of Diana filled the earth with its pale, cold, romantic, and elusive light. The moon had arisen and reigned over an altered world, a world without color, at once vague and hard, all black and white, a world of superstition, of phantasmal ghosts and fears, a world of enchantment, a new Armidas garden, where the young adore the old, where a courtesan is honored as widowed fidelity, where probity is avaricious, treacherous, and a bigot, a moonlit world where the false and the true are equally shadows, the world of Diana and of Montmorency. It was best that Margaret should die. She had no place in the new order of things. She could neither change them nor sympathize with them. Her sun had set, and the moonlight dazzled her. She, poor sunflower, could not live without the sun. Mourut par trop aimé d'amour grand et naïf. Margaret was buried in the cathedral at Lescar, the last resting place of the house of Navarre. It was observed that Montmorency sent no representative to the crowded funeral. But the poor of all the states of Béarn congregated round the solemn procession, and through all the world the men of learning and the poets poured out in rhyme and in epitaph their sorrow for her loss. They indeed would feel her death as the sudden rattling down of a buckler that had ever been held between them and their enemies. With more truth than befits an epitaph, Ol Hagare declared, All the learned, weary of living, succumbed at that blow. The queen who had saved Roussel and Lefebvre, Calvin, Farel, and Clément Marot, the protectress of Erasmus and Melanchthon, the learned muse who inspired the king to found the Collège of France, La Marguerite des Marguerites, merited so fine a commendation. Henry of Navarre mourned his wife's death, notwithstanding all their jealousies and quarrels. Without her, his petulant and vacillating character was as a ship without ballast. Day by day he became more feeble and variable, changing his mind from moment to moment, till finally the reins of government were handed over to Jeanne and her husband, who ruled the country well. So Margaret passed out of life. Others took up her tasks and filled her place but her humane and gentle influence was gone forever. In the brief and violent history of the house of Valois, no other Ageria shines. She is dead, and all her works are dead, or only live a little dimly on the shelves of historians and bibliophiles. But oblivion will never cover her memory. Rather, as the sphere of history widens, will the appreciation of her rare influence increase. Without her, the noblest part of the Renaissance in France must have perished at the Inquisition stakes. She made learning possible and secured for a time a relative freedom of thought. She taught respect for life in an age which only respected opinions. Her strong national feeling was for years a bulwark against the invasion of Spanish superstition. She showed that compassion is larger than conviction, charity more honorable than faith. Her character was not great. It lacked decision, strength, moral judgment, and the splendor of mental purity. But her impassioned sweetness made it beautiful and rare. Her mercy and magnanimity were the saving of a nation. For this, and not for her novels or her poems, she will be remembered. End of section 25 Recording by Pamela Nagami in Encino, California, May 2017. End of Margaret of Angoulême, Queen of Navarre, by Agnes Mary Frances Robinson.